You're listening to WRUULP, Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRUU.org. We are Savannah Soundings, community radio with Global Soul. Check, check, one, two. Look like a little country. Some rock and roll and blues. Cause we sure love playing for good people like you. Let me know if you can hear me Check, check, one, two Welcome to Music Local and Sustainable, the radio show that features discussions with and the music of local musicians. I am your host, Dave Lake. Tonight we have local singer-songwriter Brandon Nelson McCoy. You can hear him locally at several venues, but commonly at the happy hour at the Jinx. Welcome, Brandon Nelson McCoy. Thanks for having me. I think that every songwriter has to write a murder ballad. I don't know if that's required by the songwriter (laughs) union, but you have a widow ain't a widow. (laughs) I do, yeah. Yeah, so Widow Ain't a Widow started out as a personal love song that I'd written probably about eight or nine years ago now. And after I moved to Athens, I met a person who's become a really good friend of mine. His name is Don Alber. And Don actually kind of changed my whole perspective on songwriting. He was a big fan of story songs, and he's a big fan of the kind of archetypal American songwriting canon, so to speak. So I kind of took that song, I had the chord progression, and I had this terrible, terrible, sappy, just relationship sort of thing. And I turned it into uh, what amounted to kind of a love triangle murder ballad tied up with a Vietnam War. Call 
called to me that night in joy and in fear You said you'd slain my dear old brother My knees went weak, how my guts they creaked What had I just discovered? Some things die, yeah, and some things grow It happens that way all of the time So I grabbed a shovel and headed to your place With a bottle of the sweetest red wine Won't you tell me what I want to hear Widow ain't a widow anymore, my dear Won't you tell me what I want to hear Widow ain't a widow anymore, my dear It's got one of my favorite lines, too. Some things die and some things grow. The time when I was working on that, I just moved up to Athens and I was definitely dealing with kind of separating myself from my first phase of, I guess, my 20s. I was around 25. It was just a really big time of change in my life. I had a lot of personal things going on. Being in a new city that I'd never been in before, I think it just kind of contributed to this idea of you have to close the door on some things and you have to go forward with others and sometimes you don't have a choice which of those happens. <laughs> Often you don't have the choice. <laughs> yeah. It's way less than you would like to think, actually, I think. The other thing that immediately came to mind when I was listening to the song was, under those circumstances, I think I probably would have selected a, something a little bit stronger than sweet red wine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but I think that that kind of ties in the love affair a little bit better. When I was working on that, my friend Don, who I'd mentioned before, he, he and I kind of argued about that back and forth, and he, he's the one who finally won. I wanted something stronger than sweet red wine, but he was like, man, I, I really think you need to throw that in there like that. So shout out to him on that. <laughs> he's the one that convinced you to get more involved with the songwriter's canon. What songs does each songwriter have to write? A murder ballad, that's one of them. I think he's more concerned with the actual types themselves than I am. I think what I took away from his perspective is eliminating the personal aspect of it so much and trying to write a song that seems to be a little more timeless and also can be taken out of context and still enjoyed. I think it's, it's a great mistake to think that you're going to write anything that came from Johnny Mitchell's Blue or from Bob Dylan's Blood on the Tracks. There's like super personal confessional songs. They're great, I love them, but I think that it's very self-absorbed. I think that anyone necessarily wants to know the darkest pits of your emotions. I've tried my best to find some way to obviously instill those emotions in the things I write, but have it on a more storytelling level, I guess. It's always difficult to start off writing a song you want it to be personal. You want it to reflect your own emotions. Like you just can't turn it into a diary entry. And so many people, I think, fall to that mistake. And I've tried my best to avoid it in the past five years. So you think that's a mistake? I think it is. I think for me it is, is what I mean. I definitely have seen people, even here in Savannah, who that's their style of writing and it works really well for them. It's very convincing. I just look back on the body of songs that I had when I left Savannah the first time in 2011. They were just very personal, but they were very journalistic and kind of lacked the poetic side of things. There just wasn't anything I, I think anyone else could connect to as far as a story. And then when I was in grad school the first time, I took a class called The Nature of the Story. The running theme of the class was that each individual person basically constructs their own story based on their own individual needs. And I just kind of took this idea of the story being the central figure in everyone's life. And that kind of added to my obsession with wanting to write songs that other people could identify with. And it just goes somewhere. Like wallowing in my own self-pity was something that I did for a while with a guitar, and I don't want to do that anymore. It doesn't work for me. It sort of sounds like that's how you started. It was. When did you start writing music for the first time? 
I started writing music when I was pretty young. I wrote lyrics and poems and things of that nature from like 10 onwards, basically. I was really interested in writing, but I didn't learn how to even strum a guitar until I was about 14, probably. And then I was pretty terrible at it. So the songs I wrote were bad. <laughs> They're really bad. I will not ask you to share any of those. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. I never really saw myself in a band. I never saw myself playing in front of people. I mostly used it as an outlet. But as I got older, I was more and more intrigued by it. After moving to Savannah for my first round of school at Armstrong at undergrad, I kind of met with a few people who were really welcoming with playing music, and they were very sweet people when it comes down to being open and inviting to a young 21 year old kid who's probably messing everything up. But it was a really good time for growth. Within a couple of years, I actually wound up opening up for a band at Tantra on Broughton Street. And I was terrified. I only played five songs, I think. I was terrified, but I kind of got the bug. I really enjoyed being on stage. I really enjoyed performing in front of people much more than I thought I would. So that kind of just started this long thing let's go on from there so you were what early 20s 21 22 and yeah that you did been your first performance 2009 i think so i would have been 22 and i got pretty involved in music down here in savannah pretty quickly i played a lot of shows i booked a lot of shows i actually got in over my head i think i didn't really have the well of material that i needed to be quite frank about it so I started writing very quickly, very rapidly, and this is where that pile of personal songs kind of came from. I saw myself going towards storytelling, but I couldn't quite get there. So I wound up leaving Savannah in July of 2011, and I went to Athens. And in Athens, I met my buddy Don, and we actually started a string band pretty quickly called the Monkey Grass Jug Band. And that was really fun, and it was a really good growing experience for me. I don't think it was meant to last from the beginning. We put a lot of effort into it. We put a lot of time into it. But for me, I think that that was just a really good stepping stone in learning how to be a better songwriter and performer. From the name, it, it sounds like a bluegrass or Americana type band. Yeah, we didn't really know what to call ourselves, to be honest. We were a string band, but we didn't play traditionals. It was all about original material. It was all about our own songs. We didn't want to call ourselves a string band, so we were just kind of joking around one day, and this idea of calling ourselves a jug band came up. And jug bands originally were kind of like an anarchist folk ensemble with whatever was around. So we kind of identified with that. Your undergraduate degree here at Armstrong, what was that in? It was in English. Yeah, I graduated in 2010 from Armstrong. And then when I went to Athens, I actually went to grad school at Georgia College in Milledgeville because I really loved Athens and Milledgeville was, it's a fun town to be in for a little bit, but I can't imagine living there basically. It's a little too small. Were you involved in any bands down here or did you pretty much just played out solo? I played out solo and I put together a band called Brandon Nelson McCoy and the Sad Bastards. We played out a good bit in a short amount of time and our lead guitar player, my friend Kyle, stopped playing with us because of obligations with school. It was a senior year. And that just kind of killed it. And from there, I, act I started a, a very short-lived string band here in Savannah with Anthony and Corey, who are in the hotel. Mm -hmm. that, and that's actually how they met, was I found them on Craigslist and pulled them together. I was terrible in it. I did not have the chops to hang with those guys. So I'm very glad that they stuck with it because they're amazing now <laughs> that's Corey chambers and anthony tashira yes correct yeah they're just amazing guys hell of musicians and i was very fortunate to play with them but like i said i was very in over my head with those guys like i couldn't even speak the same language so when i came back to savannah this year my goal was and has been for about the last year and a half since the monkey grass thing stopped i just wanted to play by myself i didn't want to have a band I listened to a lot of Mississippi John Hurt and a lot of the solo blues artists from the 30s through 60s, I guess. And I was really infatuated with the fact that they could actually entertain an entire audience just by themselves. 
So I kind of made a small personal goal to just try my best to do things as a solo musician on stage, singing my own songs. I don't do a lot of covers. I don't learn a lot of covers. I just want to play my songs. I've kind of been afraid to start a band again, to be honest. <laughs> There's so many obligations that go along with it. <laughs> Scheduling and, you know, but I'm sure I will. I'm sure it'll happen. <laughs> yeah, but particularly in Savannah, because the band members here in Savannah are in such a wide variety of different bands, and so you have to schedule around that. Unlike some places where if you have a band, you have a band, and yeah. the band stays together. Yeah, I mean, I definitely know enough people. I don't think it would be an issue to start up something down here. I'm sure I probably will. I've now played two shows with an electric guitar, which is a first. I haven't even owned an electric guitar in over 10 years. So both of the shows were at the Jinx, and I love the Jinx. It's an amazing place to play, but you're in a bar. So when you're in a bar and a guy with an acoustic guitar gets on stage, there's a natural inclination to ignore him. And I think that that's just the way it is. If you're in a coffee shop, it's an acoustic. The setting is a little bit more appropriate. I played a few times this summer, and it, I had pretty much pleasant experiences all around. And I noticed that the one thing that I couldn't do was keep people into it. They would enjoy a song or two, but then they drift off. So I decided a few months ago to see if I could buy an electric and just kind of go from there. And it's been really pleasant. I played a couple of shows. I played Anderson's CD release party. I guess it was a couple months ago now. And then I played a few nights ago and opened up for a band called Continental. I mean, it was just overwhelming the amount of positive feedback I've gotten. Anderson's been really helpful. He and I seem to be kind of along the same wavelength with what we want to do musically, I think. We have a lot of the same influences. He loves Towns Van Zandt. That's a huge influence on me. He's from Texas, and I really like Texas songwriters. Like, there was immediately kind of a, oh, we're kindred. We'll just kind of see where all that electric guitar stuff goes and people might know anderson better by a.m oh, rodriguez yeah. you're listening to music local and sustainable and i'm your host dave lake tonight we have brandon nelson mccoy before you came to savannah where are you from i'm from calhoun oh okay. which is pretty much halfway between atlanta and chattanooga i grew up in a small town calhoun is it's definitely a carpet mill town. I remember as a kid, you know, my mom always worked at carpet mills. And it was just a big part of everything was, you know, being in this very localized, centralized environment. There is where you really started writing poetry and thinking about becoming an English major, probably. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I knew very early on that I, I was going to do something with writing. At first, I had this obsession with being a journalist. And then I realized that... I wasn't quite social enough for that. Incredibly funny enough, I actually left high school thinking I was going to be a high school English teacher. And now that's actually what I'm going to wind up doing. I mean, even once I got in college, that changed a little bit. You know, I decided I wanted to get my PhD and I probably would have kept on that track. But I met someone a few years ago. and We got married this year. Unfortunately, the idea of going into four more years of... <laughs> Uh, poverty-stricken education just doesn't really sound very appealing to me as a married almost 30-year-old. And I presume that you'd want to be in a place where you could continue doing music in the evenings and Yeah, that's definitely weekends. a big part of it, too. I'm sure that even if I don't play music out, it'll always be kind of a part of me. I, I don't think I can escape it at this point. If I tried to, I don't think I could get away from it. I actually kind of did try to for a little while. <laughs> it just kept creeping back on me. Now, are there any of the songs that come from that early maudlin period that you do play still? Yeah, I've got a song called Loretta. And Loretta is actually, I consider it to be the first song that I wrote that wasn't terrible. I wrote it when I was 17 or 18. I still play it now. 
it's also a murder ballad. <laughs> I haven't played it much recently. I don't even know if I could get through it right now, to be honest. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. I still play it sometimes, but I really try to focus on the new stuff, even when I'm practicing. I've got a, a hot list of seven or eight songs that I've written in the past few years that I've, I've really tried to work hard on getting the dynamics right, on getting strum patterns right, finger picking, whatever I'm doing. I've really tried my best to perfect those newer songs and try to stay away from the things I wrote once upon a time ago. Let's talk about another one, Rosie. Rosie. So Rosie is my favorite song I've written. I wrote it about three years ago. I wrote part of it in class, which is a terrible thing to admit, but I was taking a class on Tennessee Williams. Tennessee Williams is incredibly lovelorn in a lot of his plays. There's a lot of just sad, tragic relationship issues going on. And Rosie kind of wound up being a story about a guy who, he misses someone from his past, but through the end of the song, he basically realizes that he doesn't quite actually long for that as much as he thought he did, if that makes any sense at all. I think it's often the case as we get older that the things we pine for in our past aren't actually, in reality, aren't quite <laughs> as alluring as we think they are. And that's kind of what Rosie is. At the time, it was an obsession. Exactly. But now, in retrospect, it wasn't as important. Exactly. With a cigarette in my hand Thinking about Rosie Across the Rio Grande Down along the Mexican border I might could find My sweet dear Rosie If I could just find the time So I sit at a half past three in a beet blue pickup truck I had me a corn and a wind and gassed it up 25.73 in a six of Lone Star beer Thinking about Rosie, whose eyes would soon be near. But it's a long way from Oklahoma and Mendocino's on the radio. The night sky ain't too lonely, Lord, when you got a place to go. Sir Douglas, take me home now. This tequila has got me slow. The night sky ain't that lonely, Lord, when you got a place to go. Oh, I woke in my truck bed, the sun's hole my eyes. A breeze tickled my nostrils. With all to Rose's thighs First thing I knew I'd gone around Just a gilded rosary And a long string of tears But it's a long way from Oklahoma And Mendocino's on the radio the night sky ain't that lonely, Lord, when you got a place to go. Sir Douglas, take me home now. This tequila is running slow. The night sky ain't that lonely, Lord, when you got a place to go. 
place to go At St. Carlos Cathedral After a long, dirty night Her dress was tainted But it still shone bright First thing I knew Clutch had popped And the gas And I was headed alone, along that northbound freeway path. But it's a long way from Oklahoma and Mendocino's on the radio. The night sky ain't that lonely, Lord, when you got a place to go. Sir Douglas, take me home now. This tequila is running slow The night sky ain't that lonely, Lord When you got a place to go No, the night sky ain't too lonely, Lord When you got a place to go Rosie is uh, subtitled A New Mexico City Blues. Yeah. A big part of my literary influences has always been the beat generation. I did my master's thesis on the beat generation and their kind of quest for a spiritual center. I just felt that that song kind of had that same a unifying theme in the speaker's life. I think he thought that it was her. And I think by the end of the song, he realizes that that's actually not quite the case. Mexico City Blues is a collection of poems written by Jack Kerouac in the mid to late 50s, probably is when it was written. The story of that collection is he's on a bus traveling, I believe, from California into Mexico. And he's contemplating everything from jazz to his spiritual quest in Buddhism and even his kind of early influences from being raised a Catholic. I just thought that that song was kind of also a journey song, just kind of like finding out that the center in your life isn't quite what you thought it was, which I think is a kind of the heartbreaking thing about the B generation in and of itself, especially about Jack Kerouac. Now, Jack Kerouac's travels would have been in the 50s. Mm -hmm. uh, this, however, I am using musical references as the way to place this chronologically. Mm -hmm. So I'm placing this actually chronologically in the late 60s, early 70s, because you mentioned the Sir Douglas Quintet yeah. and, the, and the Mendocino album at being on the radio. Mm -hmm. so, rather than on the CD players. Yeah. Here we're talking about on the radio. So that's about 69, 70, I think. Mm -hmm. And so why did you place it in that period? I think it was just easy to do that, <laughs> to be honest. I, I don't think it was an overtly conscientious decision. I was really obsessed with the Sir Doug albums at that time, too. Like, really obsessed. I really love Doug Psalm. I think that... His kind of erratic musical explorations are very inspiring. And he also just writes these beautiful country soul, almost R&B kind of numbers. And that's really what I had in mind for that song. It, it hasn't quite made it there yet, but that's kind of my idea. Just love song that also has a nice groove in the background to it. I just absolutely love Doug Psalm. Those first few albums of his are just great. All the Tex-Mex stuff. It's just this really cool amalgamation of what we now call Americana, I guess. But it involves so many other things that don't really make it into the the normal Americana canon. You've got a lot of, you, you know, like kind of mariachi influence stuff. You've got a lot of Cajun music there. You've got a lot of bluegrass. But you've also got country mixed with soul and R&B. And that's a really cool to put together and he really does it really well. I really like a lot of the the imagery associated with Texas. 
he's drinking Lone Star in the song. Just you know, small stuff like that. I thought, and I think that it it places you in that time and space a little better. Well, he's drinking Lone Star, I think, in the first lyric, but then shifts over to, to tequila in to the tequila. in the chorus, which is funny because I don't really like tequila very much. It seemed to fit the song, but it really did. It it just it just made it make a little bit more sense. And also, if you follow the song, he's clearly getting loaded at the beginning of the song and then imagining a trip. I don't think the song actually says one way or the other whether he actually takes that trip or not. But if you take it literally, then he just gets loaded and then drives across the country. You're listening to WRUULP, Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRUU.org. We are Savannah Soundings, community radio with global soul. If your business enjoys the programming on WRUULP, please support the station with a donation. Let your customers, neighbors, and friends know that you share our vision of building a thriving economy based on a diverse and vibrant community. Our listeners will know you support Savannah's only broad-based community radio station. Become a tower sponsor or underwriter. To check out the levels of corporate sponsorship and to donate, go to www.wruu.org slash corporate. Again, to check out the levels of corporate sponsorship and to donate, go to www.wruu.org slash corporate. Thank you for listening to and supporting WRUULP. You're listening to Music Local and Sustainable, and I'm your host, Dave Lake. Tonight, we have Brandon Nelson McCoy. I've actually got another one I'd like to play, if that's okay. Sure. What's that? It's called Laredo. Mm -hmm. And while we're just talking about Texas, so Laredo is inspired by, without going into too much detail, I guess. So, you know, when you're a kid, your family just, like, they don't think that you pay attention to anything. You know, they just assume that you're off in la-la land staring at lights or something. I I don't quite understand that mentality. So when I was a kid, I remember my mom talking about her somewhat estranged brother. And I just had these snippets of conversation in my memory bank. As I got older, I realized that what was going on was he was running drugs from North Georgia down to South Florida. He was a truck driver. He's long since passed away, so I'm not hurting anybody's feelings. But I was really fascinated with the story and this idea, again, being on the road, kind of the outlaw sort of lifestyle. But I decided to place it in Texas instead of Georgia, just for effect, I guess, basically. There's something more romantic about running across the state of Texas than there is across the state of Georgia, or at least it was when I wrote the song. Up a highway 
83 from Mexico Waiting in South Texas In a town called Laredo Some and sunset fade to the dark when the lane me down with a gun. Well, Daddy sent me letters while I was alone on the road, and he said, Boy, paper houses, they're sure enough. Twofold, but keys they'll fit sun and wheels and spin. Just know your wheels treading thin. It was a Monday and that dry point was set Charlie said it'd be there Tim just don't fret But I saw clean past that next green exit sign Blue, red and white the end of my So basically, it's about someone who has, I guess, to, to use the lyrics, uh, not much of a plan in their life. Another piece of the backstory is that that particular uncle, his father was also a truck driver. And I don't really know a lot about the story. My grandmother actually, she actually passed away a few years ago. And the things that I can string together from the story is that it was her first husband and that son who the song's based on he kind of followed in his father's footsteps just out of nothing better to do i think that unfortunately people get caught up in the various pitfalls in life because they have nothing better to do the character in that song that he's from a town he doesn't want to be from he sees a way out and he takes it he seizes it and i think that while I'm definitely romanticizing that kind of outlook and you know, the kind of song it is is an outlaw kind of tale, and I'm definitely romanticizing this like shot down in a blaze of glory kind of theme, I think there's also something very real to people just getting stuck and finding whatever they can to fight their way out. You know, being from a small town in northwest Georgia, I definitely witnessed more than once people getting involved in terrible things just so they could leave. I mean, just so they could get out of there. I mean, when your reality is getting up every morning at 6 a.m. or at 5 a.m. to go to a carpet mill to work for 12 hours, only to come home and cook dinner and go to bed to wake up the next day to go back to that same machine every single day of the week. It's hot. It's terrible. The wages aren't great. The work is inconsistent. You're basically used until they don't need you anymore, and then you're laid off, and then you travel to the next carpet mill and see you know what kind of work they have for you a lot of that is kind of embedded in that song i definitely saw a lot of my family members deal with 
that small town, you know, carpet mill reality. Now, part of the reason it's Laredo is because that Texas has an allure to you. <laughs> it does. It does. And um, partially probably because it's on the Mexican border, so it, it I definitely fits got out a map. It fits, and, fits well in its story. Oh, yeah. I definitely got out a map. I wanted it to be... I, I wanted to make sure that if, if someone fact-checked me, I would be okay. Like Highway 83. Yeah, oh, yeah. I definitely... <laughs> and it, it, it was actually really funny starting out that song because... Once I decided the location, I had to change a lot of things about it. I had to change the rhyming pattern because of Highway 83. I had to, so I definitely had to work to make that one fit that particular mold. It was also really fun as a process, to be honest, because of that. I mean, you could also probably made it 95, mm-hmm. which yeah. what would be confusing with 95 here, but instead of Interstate 95, it's just Route 95. Mm-hmm. So there, there are other possible rhymes. Of course, yeah. For some reason, eighty three just works. So I just kind of, I just went with it. <laughs> I don't necessarily have uh, a wealth of justification for it. I just kind of, I took it and hauled ass, basically. The aimlessness of the character, the bad end that the character comes to, are these also songwriting tropes that need to be expressed? I think so. Yeah, I think that there's like that sense of hopelessness, that kind of lost traveler kind of archetype is something that that pops up often. And I think it's interesting trying to put your own spin on those very classic tales of woe. I mean, everybody has seen a Western where someone has, you know, been shot down in a blaze of glory when they were doing something that they weren't supposed to, essentially. You're breaking the law. You know, you're kind of an anti-hero. The audience is rooting for you, even though you're running drugs across the border. You still want them to win. And that's something, I think that's a very American thing, is to root for the underdog, even if they're actually committing a crime. I've got another song called Wasted Prayers, actually, that's kind of in the same vein. It's also a Texas song, just about a a lost traveler who just can't find your way home, basically. Since Wasted Prayers actually is the next one on my list, right oh. after Laredo, <laughs> <laughs> I think Wasted Prayers would be a good one to do. Okay, that's really funny. Oh. <laughs> All right, let's see. Here. There's a diamond in the dark, empty sky tonight Lighting up the road upon which we walk Throw in all the blood that's on my hands Oh Lord, please listen to me Mama drank herself to an early grave my daddy's spent in town I really think your tombstone said it best It is what it is, nothing more, Lord, and nothing less Cause there ain't nothing left for me now Ain't no sins trying to reclaim All them wasted the same Well at 17 I robbed me a bank in Vega County USA Took it on a steam engine bound for near Mexico A couple of caballeros fell the heat of my gun Dead before their boots so saw the sun Cause there ain't nothing left for me now The 
you recall those sins of yesternight? Hey, this ain't a man's word of required. Don't you ever step in that same river twice? Good Lord. We have an irresponsible father and a mother who's passed away. Yeah. <laughs> That's how life starts for this individual. <laughs> yeah. I think a thing that, that I wind up very interested in and I guess probably dealing with myself too is identifying with with family and like a localized sense of home. Like a so that definitely winds up in a lot of the the songs I write, obviously there's exaggeration and hyperbole and, you know, um, the truth is very stretched, but there's definitely an aspect of longing for direction, wandering until you get it right that I definitely explore a lot. And I'm also, uh, I have a conflicted relationship with religion. I think that kind of manifests itself a lot as well. I don't really see myself attaching to any religion at all, but I'm very interested in this idea of, of a higher power or the idea of some sort of unifying force. Um, but so far, you know, none of the dogma has really made much sense to me. Um, and I think the person in that song is very much so in line with that same idea. Um, how, how does that come out in the lyric? Well, just the idea of the prayers being wasted. Okay. I mean, you can pray all you want to, but if you don't believe in it, it doesn't matter. I mean, the idea of faith itself, <laughs> it's faith. Like, you, you have to believe in it for any, like, for it to mean anything. You know, you can pray all day long. You can sit at a supper table with someone saying a prayer, but if you don't share those, that same set of values, that same set of ideas, the words are meaningless. In my life, that's something that kind of resonates. It's kind of search for a higher power, but not really being able to attach myself to any sort of the the incantations or the prayers in general. Like they just, it has little meaning. I, I guess I took it as a different interpretation. It to, to me, it was more the individual saying, "Well, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. This is what my life is going to be like. Mm -hmm. So any prayers you might have for me are going to be wasted." I think that that's definitely a big aspect of it as well, this idea that you can't change your path. Um, I don't necessarily believe that, but I, I think that for the character in the song, he believes that he's set on this path. He came from a certain background. That's what put him on this path, and there's really no getting out of it. I mean, he's a hanged man at the end. He's going to die. There's no getting around that. Um, but again, that also is a very American kind of character the sort of doom from the beginning outlaw. I think that that's a very common thing that we are fascinated with. It's interesting you mentioned religion, your lack of interest in, in religion, because you sort of flirted with that a little bit back in Rosie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not a lack of interest. If I said that, I definitely misspoke. I'm definitely interested. I'm just not committed. And okay. I... I'm conflicted in really which way to go. I do think that there is a higher power. I want there to be a higher power. 
and I think that that's something I I kind of flirt around with in some of my songs, but I I definitely don't commit to anyone. I guess as a byproduct of being so interested in the beat generation, Eastern religion appeals to me pretty greatly. This idea of a circular view of of life and death as opposed to a linear that's definitely appealing and much of that power of faith comes from inside us the in, the concepts of eastern religions where reality is subjective mm-hmm. and in some cases this your songs sort of take on some of that sense of uh, don't mean to perseverate to go back to rosie but again there was another concept of the unreality of reality. The reality you thought was is not the reality that is. One of the things that I was really turned on to in grad school was I took several classes in postmodernism, and they definitely it definitely opened me up to the the shifting perspectives of reality and what is real, what isn't real, how do you know, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I don't go so far as to say that we're like. A thought in someone else's head or something like a, like that's way too far for me but I do think that y- your own reality is shaped by how you view yourself and by your own perspective and that's definitely something that I kind of just think about in my own life if you can change your own perspective then in theory you can change your own story because whatever narrative you assign yourself is how you view yourself and it doesn't matter how other people view you as long as you think that you are that way that's it and I think there's something empowering in that, but also terrifying if you can't bring yourself to get beyond, you know, your own shortcomings. So, yeah, the idea of, of, of changing your own narrative is definitely something I've, I've skirted around with. Because we're assigned a narrative based on where we live, on whether or not you have education, you know, whether or not you work this job or that job. You know, the connotative associations that are made definitely affect how you view yourself. So if you can find some way to to get beyond that or to just change your own perspective on those things, then you can make it work. You know, how does a singer-songwriter, for example, who is just a, a very beyond repaired alcoholic, who is just you know, an absent father, et cetera, et cetera. Like, how do they reconcile themselves within the world? Well, they see themselves as a troubadour. They see themselves as a songwriter. So that's, so, so the new narrative is instead of just being like a deadbeat dad who's a drunk, you're, you know, a poet. You're creating art within the world. So they change their narrative for themselves and they can continue forward. That actually seems to be a relatively common theme among authors, poets, songwriters. Being a deadbeat dad, (laughs) being an alcoholic, being depressed. You have to add depressed in there, too. I definitely didn't mean that to sound like I was was condemning that sort of, you know, change of perspective. I think that, I think that everyone has shortcomings. And I think that it's very easy to malign someone else's shortcomings and to categorize them as a bad person because of whatever their particular issues are. I think the reality of it is that I think most people actually have the same sort of issues. They just manifest in different ways. When I was teaching this semester, we talked a lot about in our classroom kind of debates. The war on drugs in America came up several times. And one of the things I think that's very interesting is that it's very easy to condemn people that use illegal drugs, and yet people that abuse prescription drugs, it's widely accepted, it's totally fine. I mean, the Rolling Stones wrote about a mother's little helper 50 years ago. It's the same thing that's going on now, and probably to a much greater degree, actually. But it's easy to condemn people that are using illegal drugs, and it's all about your perspective. It's the same thing. You know, whether you're abusing a drug or not, it's just... Like you have a hang up, you have an issue. And I I think that everyone kind of re organizes their own kind of story to justify their own inadequacies. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think it's just what we do. I think it's how you cope with being an imperfect person. 
I've actually got a song I'd like to play if it's alright. So since I stopped writing so many personal songs, I haven't really written a love song. So my wife was having some just a rough time this past spring. Um, some family troubles and stuff and I really wanted to reach out to her and you know we just got married and I wanted to provide some sort of a just some sort of point of connection to say hey everything's gonna be okay so this is called time worth being spent the first thing I wake up to is an old memory I had it once now I got it again I'm feeling a little free from the hustle and the bustle of finding your own shoes happy enough just waking early shaking all the blues I finally find myself not at odds with the entire world I ain't raving at the daylight waiting on night to unfurl Another nick in the wood, a new set of strings broken in well, I finally found myself some time that's worth being spent. Whether the weather is pleasant or the storm clouds rain, determined to see tomorrow in spite of yesterday. And I certainly ain't ever giving it back again I finally found myself some time that's worth being spent When you find yourself with troubles knocking at your door and your chest it aches and your heart is wrenched and feeling a little sore Oh, I'll be right there beside you And I'll reel it in And I'll tell you we've got some time yet to spend Pleasant or the storm clouds rain Determined to see tomorrow In spite of yesterday And I certainly ain't ever giving it back again I finally found myself some time that's worth Tonight, we have had local singer-songwriter Brandon Nelson McCoy in the studio, and I want to thank you so very much for coming in. It was a pleasure. Thanks for having me. This has been another edition of Music Local and Sustainable, and I've been your host, Dave Lake. Save this time for another show next week. Well, I know we ain't headed for the Hall of Fame. Gonna give it what we got, man, that ain't no shame. Let me know if you can hear me. Check, check, one, two. Let me know if you can hear me. Check, check, one, two.